Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Matthew, Joel Schmidt, Victor Horky. Hey, man, how are you doing? So, um, welcome. Um, just checking, can you all hear me? Hawaii, nice. How's the sound? Um, uh, yes, you can hear me, great. So, today's live stream, uh, I have a couple of things lined up. Um, I'm not sure if we can get to everything, but uh, we can try. So, I've done live streams in the beginning of the pandemic, 2020, seems like ages ago. I was doing live streams uh, every week and I was reacting to uh, videos that I found on on YouTube that were interesting. And um, I did like three or four, maybe. Oh, I hear myself back. Wait, I have to mute the sound here, I think. <clears throat> yeah, and so I was doing live streams. It was pretty successful. Uh, and I asked them, like, send me links of videos that I can react to. And I, I got a bunch of links. Um, but I never made, I stopped doing it after like five episodes. I don't know why, I'm <laughs> not sure. But I am planning to start it up again. And it should be like a variety show. So I can do whatever I want. I could have guests. I could do a call-in show. But that's easy to do nowadays. Um, I can react to videos. I can practice, play, I don't know, whatever. So for today, I thought I'm going to do a bunch of stuff. I'm going to start this uh, stream talking about my book S books multiple books and my next book also maybe a little bit uh, I'll show you some videos I made about the book react to my own videos then I have a guest on uh, David Schenkerman who is a member of my discord and also someone who managed to reach the highest tier of my discord and uh, you reach that by completing very difficult exercises in my books and he did that very fast there's now two people that have done it but he was the first one, um, he did it in like three months, which seemed seems impossible still because those exercises are very hard. So I want to ask him about his experience, uh, how he worked with it, um, if he got any benefit from the book. Just I haven't talked to him yet. Uh, we just did, just did a sound check and it worked. So um, it's going to be new information for me. And then I have some videos lined up which I could react, react to. Um, about harmony, music theory. That's always interesting to talk about. Uh, that's it for today. Maybe we won't get to everything, but I'm planning to do one live stream a week. So I'll be back and we can do the stuff I didn't do today or we have can have new stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start. It's too bad that I cannot see the stream myself. It doesn't seem to work. Uh, something is up, I think, with my... I mean, my uh, my streaming computer is connected to Wi-Fi, uh, to, is with a hard line, but uh, the tablet is wireless. And Ah, now I'm seeing it. Okay, great. Because I, of course, want to monitor the live chat, if possible. Which is also not possible now. Okay. Anyway, we're going to um, go to a... Uh, start talking about my books. So I have three books. Uh, they're all called Van Heemert System. And then it's volume one, two, and three. And I just was part of the Shrewsbury Festival in the UK, which is a great festival. It's the third time. And um, that festival, like many other festivals, comprises of two parts. You do concerts. Uh, in this, this case, it was one big concert and one uh, concert where, where I was a guest with other artists and then you do workshops and I was doing both guitar and violin workshops and of course when I do a workshop I mention my book from time to time uh, there's also already a lot of people there that already own some of the books but the one question I always get is um, which book should I buy right and um, there's not an easy answer to it because yes it is true that if you are an absolute beginner you should definitely buy book one but the problem is that the really nice part about book two and book three is the online implementation in my Discord with uh, lots of resources and a community. So 
I want to talk a little bit about uh, the books. So the best way to start that is to watch a promo I made uh, for my first book. And when we watch that book, uh, when we watch that promo, I can react to whatever it is that I'm saying in that video. Of course, it's, I'm trying to sell the book in the video, right? So it's a little bit stylized. But let's, uh, let's watch a video that I made and uh, let me react to it. And uh, it probably will give me some ideas to uh, discuss. Okay. I think my internet is very slow or something because nothing is playing. Okay, here it is. Okay. Okay, let me first try out if you can see the video I'm watching and if you can hear sound. So I'm switching to here. Okay. Can you see the video and you can let me play the video and see if you can hear it? If it's too loud or not? Hello, everyone. Finally, nine months after I announced it, physical copies of my book have arrived in the US. And okay, good. Thanks, Victor. Thanks. Okay, so let's watch this. Um, let's watch this video. Uh, actually, now my internet is okay, so I think I'm we're we're good now. So let's watch this video. And uh, this is a, a promo I made right after I launched my first book. And um, let's see what I'm saying. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Finally, nine months after I announced it, physical copies of my book have arrived in the US. And book the book one. is now for sale in the web store of DjangoGuitars.com. So a, that's the first thing uh, I should say, because lots of people mail me and say, well, I went to the DjangoGuitars.com web store and your book is not there. But that is because Tommy Davey is um, moving his store, um, his inventory is stored, and at this moment uh, his web, uh, web store is not, doesn't have the complete collection of what he has. It's mainly the guitars now. So. At this moment, you cannot really buy it or you cannot really order it. Probably you could still buy a physical copy if you go to, um, if you mail him. But I also have a web store and I will put a link to that web store in the description of this video once it's finished. So right now, the best way to actually buy any of my books is through my web store. So this jungleguitars.com will work in the future, but not right now. The link to the book in the description. I have received a fair amount of questions about what exactly is in the book. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. The book is called The Van Hemert System, and The Van Hemert System is basically the method I used myself to learn how to play. A little loud, Victor says. Okay, then I'll turn it a little bit down. I can turn it down. Let's see, maybe something like this. Let me know, Victor, if this is better. Okay, jazz guitar. And I did that in a very non-traditional way. Instead of learning skills, learning arpeggios, modes, and a lot of music theory, I did exactly the opposite. Very little music theory, no skills, no arpeggios. Instead, I transcribed hundreds of solos by both legends in gypsy jazz and in mainstream jazz, codified every lick and phrase I found, and put the essentials of that codification and organization in the Van Hamert system. The first five chapters of the system are... Okay, so this maybe needs a little clarification. Um, so the Van Hamert system is a, a term that has gotten its own life. The, the funny story is that I didn't really come up with that term myself. Or, well, I did, but the idea of it uh, came from a marketing guru. <laughs> so I once went to a workshop at my university, or where I teach, but there was a workshop for students. But, you know, if you're a teacher, you can also show up. And he was talking about how to create products as a musician, right? how to get concerts, how to make albums and... And then the one thing that stuck with me was that he said, it's very important that you put your name on whatever it is that you make. So if you start a group, right, let's say you start a string quartet, of course, you could call it the Schubert string quartet or whatever, the London string quartet. But if you get into a fight, then who owns that name? So instead, if you start a group, try to give it your own name, call it the Christian van Hamert string quartet, because now if you get a fight, you can just fire <laughs> the other three members and get three new three new members and you can continue with that name. And that was really, um, yeah, it makes, it makes a lot of sense and sounds very obvious. But at that time, it was kind of a light bulb because I was working at that time on making a guitar system or like a fretboard visualization system. And I, I didn't have a name for it, but I was planning to call it something like the Gypsy Jazz Guitar, whatever. <laughs> but then I said, no, no. 
I'm gonna call it the Van Hamert system. And it was it was quite difficult to do that. I felt a little bit uh, embarrassed, but I'm very happy I did it now because it's now like a term that means something. And also when people um, look for that, they find me also, right, on YouTube, uh, like who's Van Hamert. Uh, other people that use my system to teach, which happens, I've, I've met some guitar teachers, they also call it the Van Hamert system, right? In the end, it's a kind of a funnel towards my other stuff, right? Concerts, workshops, so that's the Van Hamert system. And it started out as a, as a purely like, um, how do I visualize the fretboard when I improvise in Gypsy Jazz? But over time became much more, right? There's a whole timing system with it, with the metronome exercises and a certain kind of vocabulary, certain kind of concepts. So the Van Hamert system is now much bigger than just the fretboard visualization. But here, when I'm talking about it, I'm, I'm talking about that beginning stage. About learning the of course, Adolf, I also have a big ego, <laughs> but <laughs> that wasn't the determining factor in the name. <laughs> Fundamental shapes. And once you've mastered these shapes, and it will take a while, you are ready to improvise on any standard you can think of. And after that, the book will dive into more advanced concepts. But with the fundamental shapes alone, you could actually play great sounding solos. Now, the book is not just a book. It's actually a 10 part video series because video is my medium. And the book is there to provide you with all the tap and all the notes and to have summaries of what I'm talking about in the video. So and in this short video, I want to give oh. you a concept that... So that's... Interesting, right? I say that, or interesting. I say that, that the book is not really a book, but it's a more like a video series. And for book one, that is definitely true. Book one is only, I don't know, 36 pages or maybe even less. But that is because I first made the videos and then uh, I kind of made um, summaries of what's, what's happening in the book. The other books after that, book two and three, it was the other way around. I first wrote everything I wanted to put across in the book, and then I made videos. Now the videos still contain more information in the book, but the books are much more fleshed out, I would say. Uh, but you need the videos, because for, I'm a video content creator foremost, right? And videos are just much better. I can show you exactly how to play it. And then the books are there, especially for the first book, it's there more to use to remind you what was said in the videos. Now in book two and three, the same, I think it's the same thing, but there is more stuff in the book for sure. Plus there is the Discord with lots of information there and a direct way to ask me questions or ask other book owners questions. That you would find in the book in the first part, the fundamental shapes part. So let's learn some fundamental shapes that would fit over a two, five, one in C. So one. So with fundamental shapes, um, that's how I start the Van Hamert system in book one. I teach you five fundamental shapes that I think if you have mastered those shapes and uh, across the entire guitar neck, then you could in principle uh, make a solo on any standard. Well, maybe not giant steps, but most standards you could play a pretty convincing solos. So what are those fundamental shapes? Um, they are based mainly on uh, stuff that Stochel Rosenberg is playing or the, the way he sees the guitar neck. Not, not everything, there's, a little bit, uh, there's some differences. But for instance, uh, when you look at this shape, which is a, um, a G minus six arpeggio, right? And this is a fingering that Stochel would use. So I show that shape and then I teach, you can play this on G minor. You can play it on A7, you can play it on F sharp 7, you can play it on C7, and uh, you can play it on E half diminished. Right? And then I show how to use that shape and start improvising. And of course you cannot remember everything that I said right now, all those different chords. But this one shape can provide a lot of vocabulary for lots of different improvisation situations and that is what book one is about so this is one of those five fundamental shapes and i think i'm going to talk maybe about that shape here i don't know let's see one bar of d minor seven one bar of g7 and then one or two bars of c6 here's a fundamental shape that would work well over d minor seven here 
here's a fundamental shape that okay. would work really well on. So that is actually fundamental shape one. It's an F major seven arpeggio. Which fits on top of F major seven, of course. On D minor seven. On E7, uh, especially if you play uh, E sus, um, flat, flat nine. And maybe something else. You could play probably also on the B flat major. Yeah, so I showed here for D minor seven. G7. Ah, here's the, the fundamental shape I just showed. And a here's what they would sound like if I combine them. A flat minor six arpeggio. So I, I play a fundamental shape on D minor and a fundamental shape on G7. And then I create a line by combining those two fundamental shapes. For two, five, one, C. Let's stick with the fundamental shape for D minor and let's learn another fundamental shape for G7. And let's combine those two. Yeah, that's another fundamental shape. Let's learn a final fundamental shape for G7. This is a uh, A flat minor arpeggio with a nine. This is part of book one of the uh, the advanced shapes. I think I call them advanced fundamental shapes. Or there's five fundamental shapes, and then after you've mastered those, I get into advanced, more advanced shapes. So this is one of them. And here's what they would sound like combined with the fundamental shape for D minor seven. To end this video, here are three short solos on a part of the standard All of Me, and all the solos end with one of these phrases. And the rest of the solo is also all fundamental. So that was an example of, of, um, of the whole solo being just fundamental shape. So I think, or it, it should be possible if you just buy book one that you sound like this, more or less, right? Uh, but not much more than that, right? So it's not, if everybody would just buy book one, uh, then you will sound very similar. Not exactly the same because there's still a lot of creativity that you can you can employ to use the fundamental shapes, but it's it's it is sounds like this. And when I play a guitar and I don't really use the most creativity I can, and it's just automatic pilot, that's what I sound like. But I, I think it sounds pretty cool. That before we get David Schenkerman in here, uh, let me show you another um, video where I play a solo uh, just like that with the fundamental shapes. I think it's also a good example. So this is a minor swing solo. Oh, stop playing. Let's start again. So I think that's a great solo, um, and it's completely comprised of vocabulary that you learn in book one, including the... That's a triplet lick, a uh, triplet lick I play a lot, um, which is from the chapter in the book with triplet licks. <laughs> so a lot of people, may, now you saw me play this, so you, you might think, oh, so you practiced this solo. No, I didn't. but. All of these phrases that are in the solo is are phrases that I play all the time. So when I hear a solo like that played by myself, I can immediately copy it because I recognize all of these shapes. And if you 
have book one and practice it, you would also recognize all of these shapes, more or less. Okay, I think it's time uh, to get our guest in here. Um, let me check if there are any questions so far. Um, the problem is that the live chat is for me is not very easy to see. How do I do that? Because the phone is not cooperating. Okay, yeah, now I can see live chat. So I'm going to send uh, David Schenkerman a message to, for him to call in to the stream. Let's do that. Yeah, there's a double. I don't know why this, why the, the connection is bad because I know it's raining here, but um, it should be. I have a good signal, I think. Yeah. Okay, let I hear David Schenkerman. So, hey, David, um, you're not hey, yet. You? You're not yet in the stream. Wait, well, I'm not in. Am I gonna do it now? Um, so I'll do that here. And then. So now you should. Be, so I get some uh, Get some comments that the stream is choppy. So was it choppy for you too? Uh, it was a little bit in the beginning, but it ended up being fine. Okay. So yeah. next should be good. So um, uh, da David, this is uh, hello everyone. This is David Schenkerman. It's actually the first time, except for the little sound check we did. Um, that I'm talking to you. Um, so uh, I don't even really know you. I, knew, I know you from my Discord, of course. Uh, I know you as a, someone that really worked very hard to complete all the exercises in my book. I will talk about that. But maybe you could introduce yourself. Um, where do you live? Uh, what do you do? Yeah, sure. You're a student, right? Uh, maybe t talk a little bit also about your guitar past. Well, I'm from New Jersey originally. Uh, that's where I grew up uh, in America. And I actually started playing music. I was playing classical piano from like a young age and I eventually kind of stopped liking it. I didn't really like the classical music at that point. So I stopped playing music and eventually I started listening to some like uh, rock and blues. And that's why I, I, I started, that's how I wanted to play guitar through that. And so I started getting guitar lessons through a teacher who was educated at Berkeley. So okay. he was really like a jazz guy. And so I, I started learning um, basic things like, fretboard positioning and but wait and so you scale. didn't you didn't play guitar before you started studying with him you just started from zero yeah i i didn't i pretty much started from zero yeah okay. i mean i i picked up guitar for a couple of months before i had lessons but all i learned how to do was you know like strum a few chords like your basic uh stuff and you know he taught me like basically what your uh teacher now would teach you like scales arpeggios uh organizing the the fretboard um ha and having that but I also kind of felt like I didn't really know what music I wanted to play. And I was a little lost because I didn't know how to put everything together to actually play a solo or anything. And that's, so the first video I watched of yours was how I got into it because I actually listened to minor swing, which is like kind of like the, the simple way to get into Django. But I, I heard it and I was like, completely blew my mind. Which version um, of minor swing? It was just the original uh, version that's like really popular, I think. 1940, and, and 1931, I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I um I saw your video that went over like how to do the chromatic rub. Oh yes. And yes. yeah, that was the first video I watched and then it was like a rabbit hole after that. I watched so many videos. <laughs> so I would say, yeah, I was in high school and basically for those couple of years I would um learn a lot of vocabulary from your videos and I would learn some of the stuff from your systems, like the timing system and, and things like that. And I would use it and put it into like sort of my teacher would help me channel that into putting it into solos and teaching me how to play through jazz standards. So that's how I, I really got into jazz, I would say. But wait, um, wait a minute. So then, that's interesting. I have a question right here. So because um, over the years, I've gotten actually many, not many, well, quite a few mails from guitar teachers, both positive and negative, um, that I was either influencing their students badly or <laughs> positively. And mostly badly when I was uh, telling them things that they were not agreeing with. 
right? So how, did you tell your teacher that you got stuff from my YouTube channel and how did you react to it? So I, so I think that my teacher understood that I was getting vocabulary from not just from scales and arpeggios that he was getting that. But I also think he encouraged it. You know, like I think he was a guy who uh, did a lot of theory and he understood the theory, but I think he also saw the value in like transcribing solos and transcribing licks. Um, and so he said, sort of go out and do it, just do it within a system and, you know, learn it across the neck, learn it in different uh, keys, make sure you understand why it works within the song. So I, I think there were times where he said, like, maybe there was some disagreement with, with how you do it, because I feel like sometimes with, with the way that you play, it is almost like all lines, you know, yeah, it is. Of course, it is. No, it is. Shapes, but, but it is at the end of the day, all lines. Whereas I'm sure when he was playing, he would use more scales and stuff. And, and I think, but, but I think. But a skill is also a line, right? You could say. Yes, yeah. You could, you could practice. But, or do you mean like he was more using the skill to come up with lines on the spot? I, I think so like that. But I, I, I honestly, I, I mean, I know for a fact that he also transcribed like lots and lots of solos. And he got lines from, you know, your Charlie Parker uh, Dizzy Gillespie, whatever, any jazz player that you know, like, he also got those lines. He sees the value in those lines. And I've talked to him, like, a lot about what actually improvisation is. And I, I honestly, at the end, didn't think that he was viewing it as something completely spontaneous from scales and arpeggios. I think that he does recognize the value in that. So I actually think that it went together. Like, those videos and, and the books, I think that they went together what he was teaching. And it helped me improve, like, a lot faster than I would have improved with, like, either one of them. And, 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 and what was your, um, what is your way of what was your way? Maybe it's still the same to, to get those lines that you were learning from my videos, for example, or maybe from another source into actual solos. So, um, for a while it was just, I, I found some older videos of yours and I had vocabulary and it was just, I used a metronome system. Like you play the line on all four clicks and right. then two clicks on the one and three and two, four, all that stuff. And I would practice that for a while until I felt like. I, I could play it um, with good timing. And then I would just, I was learning songs with him, you know, like typical jazz standards. And I would take the backing tracks and I would, you know, put the line in the backing track somewhere in the, in the improvisation. And I tried to change it up a little bit. Um, and also I was lucky because basically every lesson we would get to play the songs together. So that gave me like real experience. And I found that the more that I played it on the backing tracks, um, the more it would, the more likely it would be to come up in those solos. I think then, but but after you release the book, it sort of changed the way I practice stuff. The the second book that is. I okay, so let, let's start, yeah, let's start let's start a little bit there. So, you uh, did you did you have my first book as well? Yeah, I actually I have a physical copy over there. Oh really? Oh, you bought it from Tommy then, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the first book, okay, yeah. So the first book doesn't have this online thing. And the second mm -hmm. book, just for a reference for the people that are watching, so there is a Discord uh, where you can join, and then there's exercises in the book that very difficult exercises. One exercise per chapter in the, in the second book, in the third book, there's more exercise per chapter even. And then uh, when you feel that you are, have mastered the an exercise to a certain level, you can make a video of yourself and send it to me, and I review it. And if I think it's okay. I give you a, a title in the Discord, right? Like it's, it's based on a chess title. So like the, the highest title in chess is a, a grandmaster. And in, in my Discord, it's, it's a JGM, like jazz grandmaster. And there's even jazz super grandmaster. And um, to reach that, to reach that highest level, you have to do seven exercises. They get, well, they're not, they don't get progressively more difficult, but they are very difficult. And there's only one person who managed to do that in three months. It was you. <laughs> now you're joined, finally after a long time by someone else so my question about that is like how was that experience for you doing those exercises have you ever uh, encountered that before or did you ever practice like that before and um was it harder than you thought it was or, or was it actually pretty easy to do for you so like it's interesting because i would say no i never practiced like that before especially in 12 keys because i kind of saw that like okay guitar you know it's just about you can take a phrase and move it down positionally and you don't have to sort of learn it again. Like if you play on the piano, right. And you want to learn a lick in 12 keys. I think that it's a lot harder to do that because it is, yeah. yeah. Right. And, and so like, that's why I think 
maybe even it's unique the way that you learn how to improvise on guitar versus another instrument. But I'm not sure because I haven't really learned. But I think the set exercise was interesting about them. I think I was able to do it so quickly simply because it was like the end of my senior year and I just didn't have any work left. So I could just come <laughs> home and like just practice for hours because I had nothing to do almost. So that was so really how, can you, have, I, do you have a guess like uh, on average how much hours did you have to spend? So he's, he's saying set exercise. But set exercise means uh, that is a set of phrases that I that have a certain um, uh, similarity, right? They're all on the same progression. They all start at the same place, the guitar, something like that. And then there's a, a backing track that I made, uh, which exactly the right amount of bars to play those set exercises, but it cycles through all 12 keys. And you have to basically play them all in a, uh, without making mistakes or very few mistakes. So um, how long did it take you to learn a, si a single set exercise? So the, 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 the hard part is actually like transcribe or, or learning the material on your fingers, like learning how to actually play the phrase and, and play it in good time and memorize it. After that, I feel like it becomes um, about like getting into a mental state because I feel like when you play the set exercises, I don't know if it's exactly the same, but it's a sim it's in a similar vein as, as when you're playing with someone else or you're in trying to improvise. Like I feel the same sort of pressure. And so even if I learn the phrases perfectly, I still might not be able to do the set exercise un until I actually like play it over and over again and then get into that zone. If you're not in that zone, like, because you just will start messing up, you'll start losing your place. So it's like, I think it accurately stimulate, uh, simulates like what the real world pressure is. Very good. Uh, yeah, time, let me back to that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good observation. Actually, that's exactly the point of the set exercise. It's to put you, because the, the main problem that people uh, ask me is like, okay, this is great, Lake, but uh, you know, I've practiced for two hours, but I actually never played in a gig. And, I was thinking, what is the solution or what could I do to to solve that? Because it's basically very hard to do that anyway, right? Even even after you've done the set exercise, it's still hard. But the pressure of playing live and then come, playing those phrases that are new is just very hard for everyone, including like the best players. So I was trying to find an exercise that mimics that uh, pressure. So by having you do, memorize six lines, for example, And then also play, play them all 12 keys, where you also have to think about the next key and uh, where it starts. It puts you in the same uh, situation because there's timing involved, right? You have to be on time. You still have to swing. You have to be clean. So what you said right there is exactly right. I'm trying to mimic that situation. But now the question, of course, once you've done that, do you feel yeah. that you have a better command of the lines or is, is that the same? It's, it's interesting. Like, so... If I just learned them on themselves and played it in a backing track versus I did the set exercise, I think that the set exercise, I, I say I have a better command over them with the set exercise. But either way, like the amount of work that it takes, it definitely will take at least, I would say, depending on the set exercise, some of them were a lot easier, some of them were a lot harder. I would say it takes at least five to six hours before you can get one done, at least for me. That's for it you, depends. but yeah, like I think that's them, fast, man. I think it, that's fast. Some of them took longer. Yeah. Um, it, the, the Django book that we're doing now is like the I I'm kind of jumping around. I'm working on the dominant chains right yeah. now. That one's I know all the phrases. I just can't get it done. Like it's so long and and hard. It's like it's extremely difficult. That one's probably gonna take me longer. But I would say like I I think they do help give a better command line. I also do think that if you really want to play them well within the song, you still have to practice yeah. it within the context of the song as well. But I, I think yeah, yeah. the progression should be um, learn the line, do the metronome system, put it in a set exercise, and then practice it on the song. I think that's the best progression. Wait, do it, say it again. So uh, learn the lines, and then? Yeah, like learn how to actually you know play it with your fingers. Yeah. The two would be the metronome system or whatever system you are to get the timing of it. Then I would do the set exercises, and then I would practice it on a backing track i think after you do all that it would sh start showing up like yeah well 100%. I st yeah it's it can well you know it could still you could still have some trouble with it but so the reason another reason i put the set exercise in there is because it makes you basically repeat everything many times right both in practicing but also when you perform the set exercise you have to play every line 12 times uh in different keys but still it's it's the same finger movement um there's there's this this um principle in learning languages that one of the things that makes you really uh, master the phrases is just repeating it over and over and over again and it's very hard to stay motivated to do that right you get bored 
uh, after you've said that three times, you want to go to the next one. But the set exercise mm -hmm. just makes you do it. There's no other way. You have to do it 12 times. And, and to be able to do it 12 times in different keys, you actually have to practice it many times also. Yeah, right? You just exactly. have to do it. And um, if you don't do it, you won't get the a reward, right? <laughs> so if you right, care yeah. about that, I, I mean, it's it's like a game, right? It's like a game uh, in my mm -hmm. Discord where you get a title, you get uh, some uh, uh, some loot, right? Some reward that I made, that you get a solo, a jungle solo in tap, something like yeah. that. Doesn't matter. How how was that? Did you feel extra motivation because of this leveling system in the Discord? I yeah, I mean, it's sort of like it's it's like a fun game, you know? Like it it kind of adds a little bit of uh lightheartedness to it and it, it makes you want to do it like i want to see how much i can level up i want to see and, and some of the 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 things that you can get through the challenges are really cool like the blue stuff i thought was very cool um so yeah i definitely added like extra motivation and i liked that it was very uh linear you know it, you had a set of things that you needed to get done and by completing those things you would gain you know the ability to play over all these different progressions. I, right. I really like how structured it was. What What would you say is that uh, for the people that uh, that don't know any of my books, uh, that don't know the system in my books, of course, it's difficult to follow because um, there's lots of stuff in the book that is not in any other book with the leveling and all the set exercises and the titles. So if you want to know more about that, then uh, join my Discord and uh, you can read more about it. But uh, what would you say is the biggest benefit of working like this for your playing? Well, I would say one thing is that you have, uh, the more that you do it, I feel like the less I feel like I run out of ideas when I'm playing. I feel like I always have something to reach for and grab for. And I think that's because you just practice it so much yes. that you're never gonna feel lost. You know, you always have something to grab. I think that's one benefit. Two, um, better timing, I would say. Like just better timing overall, because you're forced to practice it and swing over a metronome. And, and I would say the third benefit, I think, which is a little more subtle, is like, I think, and, and maybe this is just because of the source material that you're pulling from, but I think it helps you kind of develop your own uh, sound too within mm -hmm. jazz because you publish a lot of, I think even all three of the books now have had like a lot of cool different things. And obviously you're doing the next book as well. And I think that part of it is you know, some lines are harder for some people than others, but I think part of it is some people like how a certain line sounds more than yeah, others, and yeah. so they might just play that more, you know? That's right, that's, yeah. That's really cool. That's funny, because yeah, that's my, uh, I was also at Shrewsbury, uh, people asked me, like, okay, you made so many videos and all those books, like, how many lines are we supposed to learn? Because I, I once said, like, if you if you study a great player like Stockholo, which I don't, didn't download, and you really look at the solos, you find basically like 20 lines, 20 phrases that he plays all the time, right? And then there's some phrases that he would only play on Force of Four, for example. But like in general, it's 20 lines, but he really can play those lines in very creative ways, connect them in all different ways, um, vary them with different rhythms, different embellishments. So they sound fresh even when he repeats them. But then people say, well, why, do, why don't I just learn 20 of them? But the thing is that you never know which 20 actually will connect yeah to what you like, how, uh, what you can do technically, um, what fits with another line, if it fits with your repertoire. So I, I say like, you have to imagine that you're alone in a room with a darts board. The dartboard, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Throw, just throw a thousand darts <laughs> and yeah, two will hit, yeah, two will hit bullseye. You remove all the other ones and then you call in the audience and say, look, <laughs> look at those two that are bullseye. Those exactly, are the ones, yeah. the, 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 the licks or the phrases that the people actually hear but you would never have uh, gotten to those two darts in the board if you have, wouldn't have thrown a thousand. Well, that that is my uh, philosophy uh, uh, about it. What do you think about that? I like it, and also it, it takes away some of the pressure because instead of focusing on like what you're playing will sound like in the end, you focus on did I learn all the lines I should have learned this week, and that's something that you can control. You can control I, I learned this many lines this week. I practiced this much. You can't control will it sound amazing because. You know, it, yeah. it takes a long time for it to start sounding good. And, and if that's like your goal, you'll always be sort of unhappy, I think. Instead, cool. you should focus on like learning the lines, you know. That's true. Yeah, yeah. focus on the work, not the goal, right? So if you, if you start to focus on yeah. the goal, if you think, okay, next week I want to play these six lines in my solo, then you will be disappointed so yeah. <laughs> a lot. Uh, I, maybe, I, maybe you heard the story, but I talked 
about this once with Oli Sorkiri. You know him, the Oli, the guitar player Oli Sorkiri. No, I don't think so. I'll He's one of the most, I think, most gigging. Gypsy jazz guitar players, but now he's actually more mm -hmm. playing bebop. But um, we, once I was meet, I met him during a festival in the U.S. and we talked about this because for me, to me, it seemed that every time I saw him, so back then I saw him maybe every three months at a festival, he was playing a whole new set of uh, licks that I've never heard before. So I was thinking maybe he has the secret. Maybe he knows the secret on how to retain all that new stuff. So I asked all these, like, how do you learn? How do you memorize all those new phrases? And then he said, no, no. He has finished. Ninety percent, ninety percent of what I practice is wasted. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what he said. So it was such a relief to hear that because I have the same feeling. Like ninety percent or even more of what I practice is completely seems to be completely wasted because I never play it. But then uh, I thought about okay, you don't focus on the goal, focus on the work because by practicing all those lines, you worked on your timing, you worked on your technique, you worked on your taste, you worked on so many things that are also important. And uh, if you manage to play just one of those lines, I always say to people, that's a victory. You should, if you yeah. manage to play one of those lines in a solo, that's a line that you never played before in a solo. Then yeah, that's a you victory. Something right? you put it in your vocabulary, hundred percent. Like there's gonna be some days when when you play and it just doesn't sound good and you can't put it together well, and then some other days where it comes out naturally. So you have to focus on um, the more the more that you get through the bad days, I think the more good days you'll have. You know. So I, I know you're looking a lot forward to my next book because so one of the things about David is that he performed all the exercises on the art stop, which is fine. <laughs> it's great, right? So um, even though I, yeah, do I play art stop in book? Yes, I actually play also on art stop in book two. But uh, it doesn't matter what guitar you use. Uh, those lines work on all instruments. But I, I know that you're really looking forward to the next book, the Bebo book, yeah. right? Yeah. especially. So because my final question for you is what is your goal in, dip, in jazz, in jazz guitar, what is, what is that you want to achieve? I would say for me, the end goal is to be able to go to a jam and, and basically play with other people. Someone calls out a tune and I'm able to, um, I can comfort, I can play solo and it would be a good solo. You know, that, that, that for me is the end goal, I would say. Do you have if a group? Do, that, I you would have a group? Be, do you have a group or... I mean, it was complicated, like, in the beginning of the year, because I'm in college now, there was sort of, like, talks about stuff like that happening, but right now, it, it doesn't seem like that, so, which gives me more time to practice, I guess, but... Well, do you have um, jam sessions I in hope, the neighborhoods? I mean, th there were supposed to be, let's put it that way. They, they keep saying that there will be, but it, it kind of gets canceled, so... Why don't you start one? I guess it's... <laughs> uh, well, you know, I guess it's easier said than done. I'll try. Like, I have to meet more people. And uh, Do you know a good bass player? You know, get connected. Good bass player? I, I think th there has to be, yeah. So there then you just to go to a bar player. and you say, listen, can we start a, a two-weekly, bi-weekly jam? And on, then you you bring some people that, that order some drinks. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, they have, yeah, they have jazz. They have a little jazz scene here, actually, which is really cool. Okay. Yeah. Cool, man. Hey, thanks for uh, joining I think in the future I will do like maybe some call-in shows and then uh, mm -hmm. who knows, maybe I'll see you again on the channel. All right, thank you. Thanks, David. See you later. Have Just uh, press thank leave you. and then um, mm -hmm. it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was David Schenkman. Um I was very impressed by um, his work ethic because... It went very fast at the talk, but he was talking a lot about set exercises, and those are the exercises in my books, book two and three. Not book one, it doesn't have it, book two and three, and those exercises are just very hard. It doesn't matter if you are ready or um, a beginner, <laughs> you will have to practice it. It's, it's not something that goes automatic, because there's so much memorization uh, involved, and he managed to do all, all of them in three months. But, uh, yeah, he said he was practicing those exercises non-stop. Um, I haven't even finished all those exercises. I still plan to do it, but I keep working on new books, so it's, it's, it's going to take a while. Um, let me see. Is there any questions in the meantime? Oh, yeah, we didn't talk about the backing tracks of my book, but somebody says here, backing tracks rock. Yeah, so the book has special backing tracks that are specially made for the... Um, Set exercises. In fact, you know, maybe, maybe I should you let you hear one of those um, backing tracks because 
I don't think until you hear it, you understand um, how useful they are, right? So, for instance, for my third book, um, I made a backing track with Christoph changes, right? So then, for instance, or let's let's do turnaround because uh, here we go. So there's a bunch of backing tracks like for two five ones, but here is one for example for turnaround. So that's one six two five in all keys. So the backing track starts in the key of uh, D. So it is A7, and then we get turnaround. So the chords are A7, and then turnaround. One, six, two, five, one. And then it repeats four times, so the third time, A7, five. One, six, two, five, one. And then the last time, one, six, two, and then there's a break. And then it moves to the key of G, so D7, one, six. Okay, so the exercise then is that you get uh, four turnarounds, four Django turnarounds in this case, because it's the third book, the Django's in the 30s book. And then you have to play those four turnarounds in the key of D with good timing, good technique. And then once you've done it, you have to play it in the key of G and then the key of C and then F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, uh, G flat, uh, B, E, A, and D again. So you do all 12 keys. So that is what a set, a set exercise is, and it requires very specialized backing tracks. So there's a backing track with Christoph changes. There's a backing track with two five ones in minor and major. Uh, dominant chain, so all dominance in a row, uh, only major chords, minor chords, a lot of very specialized backing tracks. And I think uh, I've never seen backing tracks like that before, and they are really very helpful, even if you don't do the set exercise in the book, if you just have some of your, of your own stuff, just to practice it like this is um, very beneficial. So uh, thank you for, uh, for someone um, mentioning the backing tracks. Okay, many more questions. Django before the accident. I don't really... I think he had the accident with his hand before the 30s even, by the way. But I'm not sure if you're uh, referring to that. Adolf Lopez says, great student, great work. But have you played with others jamming or even performing with a group? If so, how has that worked for you? Playing with others, performing for an audience is so different. Uh, yeah, m maybe... Uh, David, you could uh, answer that. But uh, uh, Adolf, you, I think you're part of my uh, Discord, right? So these kinds of questions are great to ask in the Discord and um, you can tag people and they can respond. So for now, I want to switch to some reaction. I found some videos um, that I thought were fun to react to. And again, I plan to do more of these videos. So if you have some videos that you found about jazz that you think could use a reaction for me then i'd be very happy to do it so send me some links the best way to do it is to actually join my discord and then uh, dm me and send me a link but for now i want to start with a video by um, robin nolan about music theory and it's a very old video it's nine years old but well, what he says is of course very good and gives me the chance to also i didn't watch the whole video yet i watched the first two minutes i thought okay yeah this is a good video to react to so let's watch that video. Switch my screen to YouTube view. Okay. Yeah, something is not really good with my internet right now. I don't know where this should be good, but here we go. Hey, how are you doing? It's Rob Nolan here, author of the best-selling Gypsy Jazz songbook series and creator. Rob Nolan, of course, very famous uh, educator and player in the scene, has been part of it for a long time. He lives in Amsterdam, which is not far from here, and um, he organizes a great festival in Amsterdam called Django Amsterdam, which is in January uh, uh, this year. I'm also playing there. Uh, Anjo de Bar is playing there. Um, Paulus Schaefer... Stockolo, Moses, Great Festival. Of course, he's playing there as well. And this is a video that's nine years old. And the, t the title is 
How important is music theory in Gypsy Jazz? Of Gypsy Jazz, Fast Track and Transfusion. Uh, all these courses and books have literally taught thousands of guys and girls all around the planet how to have fun playing the music we love, Gypsy Jazz. And uh, in this series of videos, I'm answering your questions. And in this video, I've got a question from Laura from Glasgow in Scotland. And she asks, how important is music theory in Gypsy Jazz? In well, that's a question I get all the time. Uh, <laughs> I remember in Shrewsbury, um, somebody, so I had, had this big workshop with lots of guitar players. And then um, I started, somebody asked me the question, but uh, somebody always asked me this question. It's like, okay, um, what do you think, uh, what do you think about music theory? Um, this is my experience with music theory. Is it enough? Uh, because the thing is, in a workshop like that with uh, like 20 guitar players, the level of guitar playing is very different. But also, the level of music theory knowledge is wildly different. Because some people, they come from classical guitar, right? And they know all the notes on the neck. Some people come from rock guitar and they, they know pentatonic shapes and they know uh, maybe like modes. Uh, some people maybe come from jazz, so they know all about like these scales, and maybe some they, they talk in in things like uh, uh, nine, flat nine, uh, fifth, uh, third. And some people they just they started just playing just open chords, and then now for the first time playing gypsy jazz, they don't know any of the chord names even, right? So it's it's very different. So when when somebody asks me that, the first thing I always say is like you don't need to know any music theory. And uh, the reason I can say that is because the best players in the style, <laughs> the Sinti uh, gypsies, they, they, most of them don't know anything about music theory. They don't know the names, they don't know major, minor, what it means, but they can still play. But it is very useful to know some of it, right? And then I explain what I think you should know. And I will explain it later, but let's watch, continue the video. Learning gypsy jazz. Uh, it's, that's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an important question, and I think um, I've got all, all I would say, if I'm being really honest to you, that um, it's not that important, okay? That's, not that that's important. one way I'd answer it. You know, all my, all my teachings, books, courses, everything uh, doesn't hinge on musical theory. It's there to back it up, but it doesn't hinge on it. And, you know, that stems from, I think, the best way for people to learn at whatever level. Um, I, I know in my experience that all the gypsy camps I've been to and um, you know, none of those, none of those guys read music and none of them have learned anything from music paper. Uh, not, none of that music. Uh, distinction here, like music, reading music and music theory though is very different thing, right? Um, I, it sounds a little bit to me like, uh, let me fix the screen. It, it can look a little bit nicer because now, um, how do I do that? There's, you see these white bars, right? Let's let's get rid of them. That's better. Much better. Okay, so um, he's now kind of conflating between the two, and I understand it. A lot of people do that actually, because uh, especially people that don't have any experience with reading. I'm not I'm not sure what um, Roman Nolan's experience with reading is, but a lot of people think that reading music. If you can read music, you know a lot about music theory. And uh, But I can tell you that is <laughs> not the case at all, because most classical musicians that I know, and I know them until a very high level, uh, don't know, know very little about music theory. Right? Um, it's not something they're particularly interested in, and it's also not very necessary to a certain point, because, well, if you can just read the notes and know where they are on the instrument, you can play those and you work on interpretation on how to play this. Play this. Now there is a argument that can be made that you would be a better interpreter if you understand the harmony behind it. But also realize that uh, that can be sometimes almost impossible because depending on the composer you're playing, because it can be so complicated that it, 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 you will be spend more time uh, learning about the harmony than actually learn to play it. And now we get to the same thing with gypsy jazz or jazz in general. You can sp so spend so much time um, talking and thinking about harmony that you forget that you just have to be able to play a great solo after somebody counts to four and there's this relentless uh, rhythm and that you have to fit into. We'll, uh, I'll 
get to more details later. But uh, for classical musicians, it's very obvious that that is not really necessary to know all of that. You can just read the notes. But for musicians that can't read, they kind of assume that that reading skill is intermingled with knowing theory. But that is very far from the truth. Exists on music paper, and it hasn't done for generations and generations. It's been passed down from father to son, cousin to you know nephew. That's how it goes, and that. You know that says a lot you know and they're human beings just like us so you know we've got the same capabilities as that it's just that we often put theory and uh, the written word in the way um, I understand exactly what he's saying I, th I, I think he's just talking about music theory but he seems like he's talking about reading music which is not the same because uh, I can talk about music theory without writing anything down right we could just say okay we're gonna play a minor major seven <laughs> And then we don't have to write down that, that chord symbol, it's just a name, right? But he says something interesting. He says we're all human beings, so we should have the same capabilities. Yes, but don't forget, if you grow up from uh, age zero <laughs> with hearing that music all the time and the greatest players in that style living right next door, the ability to hear them, play with them, ask them questions, learn the songs, solos directly from them, of course, that is a huge advantage in learning this music. And that's basically how, for example, Paulus Schaefer and Moses Rosberg uh, grew up. And even Stochel, because Stochel grew up in a camp with uh, Wasser Grünholz, who was a great player, and Fabi Lafortin, who was visiting uh, a bunch. So uh, in that environment, it's, of course, much easier to absorb the, the sound of... of, of or to uh, kind of internalize what it should sound like. Um, that benefit, you don't have the benefit if you just grow up not, not in the gypsy camp. So yeah, we have the same capabilities, but you do have a disadvantage if you don't grow up like that. I don't know why exactly, but we like, we like to see things, to hold things, to talk about things, instead of actually to kind of just uh, feel them, you know, and play them. Um, and I know that, you know, I've taught a lot of students and the way that people really learn is if you know you look them look at them and you, they look at your hand and you say play that and then the guy plays that and he goes no no that's not it play it. that's it and then he plays it a few times and that's exactly how um uh Sinti learn in fact so if i i mean I, i've seen that many times but it's, it's it goes as far as like if i if there's only one guitar right and i want to teach a song to paulus for the chords then uh I can give him the guitar and do the chords on my hand, the shapes, and he will, because he, of course he played many songs, he will know, okay, this shape, then it should be here in this key, right? He, he kind of understands these progressions. So I can just put the shapes on my hand in the in, in, in same position, or I, I maybe move them a little bit up so he knows to move his hand. But then, because he's seen those shapes so many times, he, he understands what the chords are, even if I don't have a guitar. And that's how they teach each other as well, that maybe with two guitars, but they can also just use their hand. And they don't need the names, it's just shapes based for the rhythm. And then for solos, it's also shapes based. It's not a coincidence that all the Dutch Sinti play diminished like this. Right? This like one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, and then this shape. It's Stochler does it like that. As Stochler told me that he saw Wasser Grünholz play it like that. So that's, they all use this fingering. Now if you go to France, uh, there's lots of people that play it like this. Why? Well, Birelli plays it like this. Angelo de Bar plays it like this. So they're French, right? They, they were in the neighborhood of the other guitar players and they started playing the minutes like that. Right? And then he's got it, you know. Uh, there's no... There's no like, well, let's, you know, if you're looking at the paper and you're kind of theorizing about it, I think, honestly think that it can get in the way. So my whole thing is like not to get bogged down with music theory. Um, on the other hand, I'll say that, you know, we, we can, if you can read music and you, you do understand chord symbols and chords, then if you use it <clears throat> as a reference or something to back you up, um, then it's really, it's really useful. You know, for example, you know, I've got friends who, who are great sight readers and can read music. And if they're looking for a, a new arrangement of a song, then they can go to some guy, you know, that's done an arrangement and, and read it straight away. And they've got it, you know.
Because maybe that... Uh, <laughs> I doubt that, actually. I mean, sight reading... It depends, it depends a little bit if they're guitar players. Uh, in my experience, almost all guitar players I've ever met, and I've met them in different styles, except maybe for one, were below average readers. If you compare them to many other instruments, like uh, violin, uh, piano, any woodwind instrument. And it's even in me, right? Because I play both guitar and violin. Now, if you put something in front of me and you give me a violin, I can al read almost anything. Even if it's very, very difficult, I can probably read it immediately without practice, or I need to look at it once, maybe put some little fingerings in there, and then I can play it. Don't try that with guitar. Like it's gonna take me a much longer time. Like say, let's say ten times as long. And I think I'm actually a better reader on guitar than most guitar players, because I have that experience as a violin player. But because those instruments are so different, uh, a guitar neck is just much harder to uh, wrap your mind around than a violin uh, neck, because it's four strings and it's smaller. Guitar is six strings. It's much bigger. Uh, yeah, also only the six strings makes it much more difficult to to read. Also because all the notes are everywhere, right? This C is, is all in many different places. So uh, yeah, violin, that's the same uh, thing you could say, but it's not really, right? Um, it's very unpractical to play very high up on the G string. So if you see a C, there's basically two places you can play it. Uh, reading on the violin or saxophone is just much easier than guitar. So even... A good guitar reader probably wouldn't be able to play a new arrangement from a score. Yeah, the chords maybe, but not not melody lines. Very rare. A video doesn't exist or something. And, uh, you know, so that's a really valid way of learning music. Um, so, you know, if you can read and stuff, then that's great. I would say in this music, and um, it's not essential. And to be honest, ever since I've really been played this music, I haven't read any any of this music you know i went to music college years ago i went to leeds to a uh, it was called a classical and light music course um which uh which had a lot of theory and stuff and of course you know I, it didn't excite me it didn't get me going so i didn't really learn it and uh, i was just interested in playing the guitar simple as that really and uh, i think in this music essentially i would say that you know getting down to the you know specifics that Chord symbols really help out, you know, like in the gig book, for example, or, you know, you've got a music chart and you can see the names of the chords for anniversary song, E7, E7, E7. That kind of, that, that helps out. You know, you can see the chart and, you, and you, can, you can practice the chords there. So here do we get to what I think you should know, uh, music theory wise. And not because you have to know it, but because it will make your life easier. So uh, Ronaldo already says it, chord symbols. I think you should know the names of the chords. You don't have to, right? You could always say like, well, Stochler doesn't know it. True. But Stochler would even agree that it would be very helpful to know it. Only to communicate uh, with other people, other musicians. If you could just say, the next chord is E7, that makes it so much easier than always having to show the next chord. <laughs> and you can write it down. Right? You could write down a chart and people can immediately read it. And I, there's two anecdotes that come to mind. So the first one is that uh, I saw Paulus teaching a workshop. I actually was also at the Shrewsbury Festival about two years ago. And I came in from my workshop, uh, finished early, or he went on longer, I don't, know, I don't remember. But I came into the workshop and he was trying to show someone an A minor bar chord, like this, right? <laughs> But Paulus doesn't play it like that. He played it like this, with his thumb like this. And the student just didn't get it, right? He's doing all kinds of weird stuff, but he was not getting this chord. And Paulus was just not like this all the time. So after uh, trying this for like two minutes, he gave me a look. I said, what do I do? And then I said, well, it's an A minor bar chord. And then, of course, the person immediately played this. And Paulus was like, I don't get it. But here you see the, the value of knowing the chord names. Because if Paulus would have known it's A minor bar chord, he could have just said that and would have taken him 10 seconds to explain it. Right? So for communication purposes, I think it's good to know the chord names. And it's not that difficult. Right? There's, you don't have, to know, don't have to know like A7, 39, sharp 11. Just know like minor, 
major, major seven, minus seven, seven, um, have diminished, diminished. If you know those chord names and how to play them, I think it's probably good enough. You don't have to know anything else about uh, chords, the structure of the chords. And then the, the other thing that I think you should know is common progressions, like two, five, one. What does it mean? Well, in C it means D minus seven, G seven, C. So you just have to learn all the two, five, ones as phrases. I made a video about that, uh, which is called how to memorize 100 jazz standards fast. It's on my channel, I will link it in the description. But sh you should know uh, two, five, ones, turnarounds, uh, Christoph changes, dominant chains. I think that's it. And it sounds like a lot of work, but you could probably do that in about six months if you just practice it every day, uh, just walking down the street. Because it's not about calculating, right? It's about saying those formulas as sentences. If I say Christoph changes in B flat, you should just be able to say E flat, E diminished, B flat, G7, C minus 7, F7, B flat. It's just something I memorized. It's not something I'm calculating. You could show it to someone else and they can learn. But beyond that, and the melodies as well, you know, if you learn the melody from a book, if you've got no other reference, then then that's fine. I just think that beyond that, when you start to theorize and start to analyze and start to, uh, I honestly think it can get in the way. So just watch out for all that. Um, so that's my brief answer to this. Um, and check out any of my teaching, any of my books or courses. It's all hands on, backed up by a little bit of uh, theory. And I sometimes explain things in a theoretical way very occasionally. <clears throat> and I write stuff down um, as well to back it up. But it's not the main focus of learning this music because I don't think it's the best, quickest way to learn. So that's my answer to you, Laura. And uh, any other questions? If you've got a question yourself. Yeah. Um, let's see. With a comp, which, okay. Uh, somebody is asking which shapes, uh, which videos show the shapes you play on the guitar neck. If you search for uh, my name, Christopher Van Hamer, and then search for Gypsy Jazz Rhythm Guitar, you'll get my tutorial. And uh, you, will show, you will see that I only show eight shapes, which is enough to play any song. Next thing I want to get into is a Facebook um, comment. That I posted. It is not a Facebook comment actually, it's a, um, a comment that I got on a YouTube video, but I posted it on my Facebook. Let me see if I can show you that. Because it's an interesting topic which is very relevant, I think. Okay, let me see if you can see that. Now you can't really see that. I, maybe I can capture it. Let me see. And I should change this window. Well, you know what? I You can, but I'm going to read it. I will read it. I will, next time I'll make sure that I have a setting here so I can show you. But here's what happened this week. Somebody posted on a video of me showing the chords to uh, I'll See You in My Dreams. And I showed how to play rhythm. It's that song that goes like... Um, that song. So I show these chords and I show you how to play them. And as you can see, I'm jumping on the guitar neck, right? It's like B flat, B flat minor, F, D7, F, D7, G7, C7, F7. It's just typical gypsy jazz rhythm. This is how most people would, would play this um, this tune. And then uh, somebody <laughs> commented. It says, force leading will produce smoother chord changes. There's no need to change notes that don't need to be changed. In this respect, all chord choices are mathematically predetermined by the first chord in the progression. Good groove, though. So he's basically saying that I'm moving too much on the guitar neck and I should uh, try to don't move my hand that much and just keep notes that are part of the next chord, keep them down and just only change notes that need to be changed for the next chord. It's called voice leading. It's where you uh, try to move notes as little as possible, smallest intervals possible. 
And then I got into a whole discussion. I, I, I reacted with, well, you either don't play guitar or don't play gypsy jazz or don't like jungle recordings or a combination. And then he got very angry with me and started calling me names. And um, I reacted to that. Then in the end, um, there was many comments. And I think he read it and he thought to himself that he came off as being a kind of a, an asshole. <laughs> and he deleted the thread. So it's gone. But I want to address this because I've heard this many times before, actually. Where people say, well, you know, that gypsy jazz rhythm, they're jumping around the neck. Why don't they just use more voice leading? And voice leading is something that comes from basically classical music. For string quartets and choirs, four-part harmony, where you try to do this most of the time because it creates a very smooth sound. And it's very applicable to, to string quartets and choirs, but it's a whole different music style, right? So for me, I have a problem when you use aesthetics from another music style to judge the aesthetics of, of another music style. So to use the aesthetics of voice leading and then claiming that using that will actually improve the sound of gypsy jazz. But what you're basically saying is that this principle from another music style can improve all the jungle recorders you've ever heard. It's ridiculous, of course, and doesn't really work. It's not how Gypsy Jazz Rhythm is supposed to sound. But then on my Facebook uh, page, people started discussing that. And I want to show you why it doesn't work. So let's take a simple song like Minor Swing, right? Minor Swing, A minor, D minor, E7. People play Minor Swing like this. A minor, D7, uh, D minor, sorry. A minor, D minor, E7. A minor, D minor, A minor, E7, B flat, A minor, right? Some like this. So you've seen that the first three chords, I jump from uh, the fourth fret to the ninth fret to the sixth fret. That's how most people play it. And he said, well, that doesn't sound as good as if you would play it like this. So let's think about it. So if I play A minor like this, let's say three strings, then for D minor, I would have to keep this A because it's already part of, a, of D. This F sharp should be an F, and then this C should be a B, like for D minor six. It becomes something like this. Maybe we could add this D here. And then for E7, I should make this a go to an E G sharp. This go to here. So we get this. So now the chords sound like this. Let's say A7. Now D minor should be something like. So let me play one chorus like this, and then one chorus like every other gypsy jazz guitar player would play it. Right. One, two, one, two, three, four. Now, I think the second one sounds way better. It's not only because of these chord shapes, but it's because I can now just hit all those strings or I can make the same movement. I don't have to play very uncomfortable chords, voicings, very weird bass notes. And also this sounds very classical if I play like this. It's not the sound of gypsy jazz. That's why I got a little angry with uh, that post. And that's why I think voice leading is just a non-issue in gypsy jazz rhythm, and you should never pay attention to it. You can, right? If you want to, and it sounds good, then yeah, do it. But it's not a determining factor uh, to judge if it sounds good, yes or no. The only thing that is important is that you play the right chords and that you have a good rhythm sound, that you have a good rhythm, because that's basically your, your function. It's not to create this really nice 
quite I like voice leading. Okay. Good that I addressed that. Um, you know what? I've been online for a long time, I think. I think it's good for now. Um, let me see. I see. I see many messages that are retracted. I don't know what that means. Some kind of something in the YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. YouTube's probably. Did you say something weird? I don't know. AC guitar. What was your message before? With accompanying videos showing the way you play the melodies on the guitar neck. Oh, the melodies. Uh, actually, that is interesting question because I never make videos where I play the themes. Not because I don't think the themes are important. Of course, the themes are important, but that's because not, that's not my interest. right? The themes you could learn from many sources. Uh, it's not the most difficult thing to learn. I think it's more interesting to talk about just improv that's why my channel is about improv if you want to learn the themes i would say go watch another performance of a of a of just a group or uh, listen to uh, singers like Ella Fitzgerald or sinatra and try to get the theme from them just figure it out on your guitar or uh, play them uh, or write them down something like that yeah. or, or try to get the original lead sheet which is sometimes difficult but uh, on youtube or uh, on on the internet, there's a lot to be found if you just type, you, you type the title of a tune and you go to images. So in Google, you type um, all of me and then you go to images. Then you can sometimes get um, very original, maybe not the original, but old lead sheets. And then uh, you have the lyrics and the good melody. Okay. If there are no other questions, then I think... Um, it's good for now. I see. Paul Gibby says 12 keys is not so bad on guitar as on sex. Yeah, that's true. Definitely true. Sergio Andres Fajo says hi. And then you have a comma. You, did you want to say something else? Because otherwise I just say hi back. I think I'm going to end the stream. And... Um, of course, I want to thank David Schenkerman again for uh, joining. Uh, I'll be back next week um, reacting to another video I find, found. I found a video, two videos by uh, Nara Sol, this a piano player, amazing piano player. One is about harmony, interesting video. And also she made a video about uh, bebop and what she learned, how she learned to play or how she understood bebop as seen by a classical musician, because he's a classical piano player. It's a really great video, also really nice to react to. Uh, also, because my next book will be, be a Bebop book, and I will talk about that then more if I react to that video. Uh, see uh, another comment. Uh, it's easy guitar, because I said that uh, luring themes, you can just use uh, lead sheets. And he says, yeah, but the synth you learn by watching the guitar neck Video showing how to play melody guitar neck would be the best way to learn, wouldn't they? Yeah, probably. But um, so you see, for me, it's not so interesting to teach that because uh, it's not very, it's not, you know, my videos are actually about stuff that I'm learning myself. So if I make a video, a book about Django in the 30s, it's because I'm very interested in Django in the 30s and I want to learn those lines. So then I make videos about it in a book and the next book bebop i'm very interested in getting more vocabulary in my fingers by uh, for example pasquale grasso charlie parker um this gillespie but powell so then i write a book about that <laughs> but i'm not so interested in learning the themes because i already know all the themes so the, the chances are very small that i make uh, very low that i will make a video about that but again i think if you just type in YouTube, then type uh, all of me, and you'll find a performance by, uh, or type all of me, Gypsy Jazz, you'll find a performance um, a, from many guitar players playing the tune, and you can just learn the, the melody from those videos. Just slow it down and figure it out bar by bar, right? You see somebody play all of me. Then just slow it down and just learn them note for note. With all the embellishments.
bends, chords, but, but I'm now just improvising this melody. Um, so if I would teach it, I would teach them, teach it more like this. So you won't even have the original melody. It's more improvised. But I think that's a better way to play it than just play. It's kind of boring. Anyway, thank you all for uh, watching. Um, I have to get into the groove of this live streaming thing. I haven't done it in uh, three years. But I'll be back next week. If you have suggestions for me, let me know in my Discord. If you want to join the Discord, there's a link uh, in the description. I'll put it there, but I think it's already there. I'll put the link to the, um, let's say the video about learning how to play rhythm. Was there anything else? I think, yeah, I'll put the link to the video about um, learning how to memorize chord progressions and how to learn them as sentences. Thank you for watching and I will see you all next week.